We've got a special one-off for you this week before we launch into our new series, next series, next week. And the reason we're doing this one-off is because we know, let's just keep it 100 from Jump Street, we know from interacting with you guys, from messaging you guys, from seeing what you post on social media, we know you guys are wrestling with anxiety due to all of the uncertainty and unpredictability of this season. <laughs> and by season, I mean like the last couple of months. It's been a minute. And so we know you're wrestling with anxiety. What's more, we know that a lot of you are wrestling with depression. I mean, just students in general, whether you guys are like nationwide or globally, students in general are really wrestling with depression as a result of isolation. People don't do well when we're by ourselves and we've, between quarantine and social distancing, that's something we've been having to do for a while now. And so I know you guys are feeling this anxiousness and this depression and so, I mean, and, and it's very specific. We want to see your suffering. We want to speak to your suffering. So we know a lot of you guys, I mean, you've got all this anxiety about COVID. Like, will I get COVID? Will one of my family members get COVID? If someone has COVID, like, are they going to be okay? What is it like if I had it and then I don't anymore? Do I have antibodies? What's the research on that? I don't even know. What chart do I read? What graph? Do I, I don't know. There's a lot of confusion there. That's uncertain. That's unpredictable. That, that's stressful. What's more, I know a lot of you guys, just from interacting with you guys, you're worried about masks. Like some people wear masks, some people don't. Should I wear, should I not? If I, if I really believe in like wearing one and I wanna do that and others aren't, am I gonna get COVID? Like these are things you guys are thinking about, you guys are worried about. And then let's just talk about school. Some of you guys are really struggling with learning online. That is not everyone's thing. Some people really struggle with it. Some people need that anchor of being in person and be able to, and have the ability to be dialogical and ask questions. So some of you are really struggling with school right now and you're like, I don't know how I'm gonna finish out the school year. Like my grades are bombing right now. This is hard. It's not that I'm not trying, I'm just not, not good at school online. Some of you guys, I've been playing sports for a minute and you're like, awesome, this is my senior year and like Friday Night Lights is probably gonna look different. I don't know what that's gonna be like or like is, my sports season gonna get canceled? Or maybe this is gonna be your first year where you're like, this is my first year I'm gonna start. Mm, Friday Night Lights, mm, sold out gym, and it might look different this year. What's more, and lastly, some of you guys are stressing about church. Like, when are we gonna get to meet together again? I feel like it's been like three years. Like, when, what's that looking like? I kinda miss going to church. I kinda miss seeing my small group and worshiping together. I miss that. And so we see you. I think as a student ministry, it's important to see you and to speak to your suffering. Otherwise, we're just gonna be talking about hypothetical things. We wanna be specific. And so we wanna to speak to this anxiety and this depression today. And as always, we wanna do it through a biblical worldview because that's what, that's what we're about here. That's how we roll in student ministry. And so what we do is we always endeavor to go straight to the word and we see what the word has to say about something. We let scripture speak in to the situation. You don't need my musings and like my tried ideas. Nah, we go to scripture and we let it speak into the situation. And then we let the Holy Spirit make the text come alive to us. The Holy Spirit will counsel, direct, teach, and give us discernment to let the text come alive to us so then we can apply it to our lives. That's what we do in student ministry. And so as we get into the word today, here's my goal. I'm gonna just keep it 100. My goal is to give you permission to feel a certain kind of way. To give you permission to feel the way that I know you're already feeling, that m most of you are already feeling. But then I also wanna give you some helpful practices that I think could be of comfort and assistance to you as you're moving through this weird season. Kinda of did a similar thing to that last week, but I wanna speak specifically again to anxiety and depression. And then I wanna give you some reassurance at the end some reassurance in the promises of God, reassurance in the deliverance of Jesus. That's, that's kind of what we want to do today. So I want to give you permission, I want to give you some practices, and I want to give you some reassurance at the end. And so here's how we're going to approach things today. This is going to be a little different. Lately, I'm, I'm going to kind of give you guys the, the playbook, all right? I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of like let you see behind the curtain a little bit. Lately, we've been doing sermons, messages that are topical, where we take a topic, and we look throughout scripture, we talked about this last week, we look throughout scripture to see what scripture speaks to that topic, to that subject. And what we try to do is try to be consistent. We go through the whole Bible to see how it's consistent. We try to, in each passage, make sure we're being true to the context. And then, okay, here's what the Bible says as a whole throughout the Bible about this topic. But sometimes, 
It's good to get more specific and to dive into a particular passage. So you don't really look at, you know, what it says throughout the Bible. Mm, actually, you look at what it says within a passage. And this specificity helps you control context because sometimes I've heard topical sermons where people are just like pick and choose stuff and they kind of cherry pick what they want. Mm, we can be, and you know what? I have to be super careful about that too. So sometimes it's good to just dive into a particular passage, especially if it's one that speaks specifically to where you guys are at. And I think that's where we're going to be today. Uh, by illustration, by analogy, I'm not super into it, but I know everybody else is, so I feel like uh, these illustrations work. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. You can pretty much watch all the Avengers movie and get the gist of it, right? Like you can see like the, the narrative arc of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But when you get to the end of Endgame and you see Iron Man, spoilers, you see Iron Man's sacrifice, it won't mean as much to you. You won't really know about Iron Man's backstory or his clout in the cinematic universe if you've never watched Iron Man. So sometimes it's cool to just be like, I'm gonna watch all the Avengers movies so I kinda get the big picture. That's kinda like a topical sermon. But sometimes you wanna get into a particular text and really kinda unearth it and unpack it and understand it. And that would be like watching Iron Man. Or maybe even watching all three Iron Man movies so you go, okay, I understand Tony Stark's character arc and a little bit about him, so now everything makes more sense. And it actually kind of hits a little bit more that way. It's more personal. And especially then when we get to the end of Endgame, woo, like I'm just deep in my feels. So that's what we're trying to do today. We're gonna to get into a specific passage. So we're gonna be in Psalms, and we're, we're gonna look at Psalm 42 and 43. Now let me give you just a quick setup on Psalms, the book of Psalms. It is a book, actually a collection, I would even say a library of prayers and songs. It's one of the biggest sections of the Bible. And it's these prayers and songs. And here's what's beautiful about them. Some of them are written by individuals for individual use. So think of like throwback OG Taylor Swift. Like she's just sitting in a room, picking a song out on the guitar, and it's just about her. And then some songs are written by many people to be sung by tons of people. Think like Hillsong. Elevation, stuff we sing at church. It's written for the masses. Our student ministry um, worship and creative team right now is, is working on some stuff. And they're trying to write songs written by a team of people for a group of people. And so you get both in Psalms and it's really beautiful. And sometimes you can sing these really personal Psalms, songs, and prayers as a big group of people. And sometimes you can sing these songs written for big groups of people as an individual. And so you see both this kind of personal and corporate aspect to the Psalms. And so, going through the Psalms, I mean, you can find everything. And what's beautiful about the Psalms, too, is there's this composition to it. Like, it's got a little bit of everything. So, like, I get tired of albums that I hear where every song sounds the same. Like, I just get bored. But I like when there's different varieties, different genres of songs. And that's how Psalms is. Some Psalms are Psalms of Thanksgiving and praise. Some are Psalms of confession. Ugh, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Some songs are, or some Psalms are psalms of lament, where it's just like, this is, this is rough, like, this, is, this is bad, let's just be honest. Some are celebrating the kingship of the Lord. Some are actually looking forward into the future to the coming of the Messiah, the King, Jesus. And so what we're gonna look at today, it's, it's, we get this like really good, robust, diverse mixture in the psalms, kind of like a good Spotify playlist. You know, it's got a little bit of everything. That's what the psalms have. And today we're looking at a particular genre of psalms called lament. It's that sad song. It's that recognizing that stuff's not great right now. We don't have to front, we don't have to pretend stuff isn't great. And so we're gonna look at Psalm 42 and 43. And um, we're gonna see that they're really raw and they're really real. They're not holding anything back. That's another beautiful thing about them. And we're gonna see that they're, they're art. They're written as poetry. And sometimes for you like more cerebral, heady type of people, you want like facts, stats, logical. Hey, we'll have some of that in the sermon. But some of you know that good art moves your soul in a way that facts and stats and stuff like that just can't. And so I hope you're moved by the art today. I hope you're moved by the poetry. And what's really cool about Psalm 42 and 43 is they're like part one and part two. Like one kind of just runs into the other. They're kind of connected. Again, last reference to it, just because I know everybody is obsessed with these. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you've got Avengers Infinity Game and, and or, or sorry, Infinity War and Endgame. It's like one giant movie. I think they may have shot it as one movie, but it's like one giant movie split in two parts. That's what Psalm 42 and 43 are like. It's kind of two parts of a whole. And this, <clears throat> let's actually read the intro to it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna invite you to go to Psalm 42 
Psalm 42 says, <clears throat> To the choir master, a mass skill of the sons of Korah. So this is a song written by a group of people for a group of people to be sung corporately, like a song we would sing in the church. And it's called a mass skill. Well, a mass skill back in the day was a type of song. So like, if you ever listen to hip hop, there's like a diss track. Sometimes someone puts out a diss track. Sometimes someone puts out a hype track. And the point of this song is to get someone hype or to get you like juiced up about something. Sometimes you have a slow jam, which is supposed to be like smooth and like but butter smooth and kind of relaxing. So a mass skill, and the, the word that's kind of used to make up this word in the original language, actually means an, a song of instruction, a, so, a song to teach you something and a song to help you prosper. So in this time of anxiety and depression, I want to teach you something that will help you prosper in this time. This is what this math skill is. And so let's just get into it. Verse 1, again, we're going we're to go into the text today. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. I want to post up there for a second before we go to the next part. This whole dear pants for flowing streams. My soul pants for you. My soul is thirsty for God. Okay, so you might have this picture of like a National Geographic like animal special where it's like, look at the deer. As they go next to the water, they lap up the water. Serene, tranquil scene. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like a documentary you'd watch and be like, oh, next. This is not a tranquil scene. It's not like a deer by a babbling brook. No. Actually, this illustration is all about thirst and longing, and all the words in the original language have to do with thirst and longing. Uh, if you've ever played sports, or if you've just ever run, or ever been outside, let's just say at an amusement park, and you haven't had water for a while, you know how your lips kind of get like chapped, and your tongue's dry, and you, like, you're just exhausted until you get some water? That's the feeling we're supposed to have at the beginning of this psalm. Like, man, I'm tired, man, I'm thirsty, man. <sighs> it's been, like, I'm worn down. I'm longing for something. Or like, just think of it, you can almost use hunger too, like, man, I'm starving. That's kind of the spiritual condition and spiritual state of the people writing this song. I mean, that's probably where you're at right now. Some of you are probably exhausted and you're thirsty for something to bring you some peace or some comfort or some ener to energize you. Some of you might feel spiritually dry, especially you more discerning types. You might feel kind of spiritually dry. Like, man, I've been disconnected from church. Man, I've been disconnected. I'm starting to feel disconnected in my faith. I've had some students share that with me. And so this should hit with you guys. This should hit different. This might vibe with you. Man, as the deer pants for flowing water and for streams, my soul pants for you. Now, when we see the word soul, let's look at the word soul. In the original language, this is just the deepest part of you. It's like the core essence center of your being. It's that thing from which everything else flows. It's the truest you. And so the people writing this, they're saying like, mm, our souls are longing, our souls are thirsty. And when something's wrong with your soul, it like permeates to every aspect of your life. You can't just like mm, ignore that. It's like central to who you are. So if you're struggling with this anxiety that's like deep in your soul, yeah, you can do things to try to cheer yourself up, but that's still gonna be there. It's gonna be groaning there. Yeah, you can try to distract yourself, but it's still gonna be there. Same with feeling depressed or just down. And so we can vibe immediately with the psalmist. But then, okay, it kinda takes a turn here. The psalmist says, my tears have been my food day and night. That's super depressing. Like the only thing that's like, they're thirsty, but the only thing that's kind of like hydrating them is their tears. That's depressing. And then it says, verse 3, second part. While they say to me, they, it's gonna, we're going to learn as enemies. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Where's he at? Where's your God at? So it's like the psalmist is like, man, I'm longing for the Lord. I, I really like, oh, I'm in this bad season. And then people are coming up and be like, yeah, where's your God at, by the way? Because like things aren't good. And things aren't good for you. And so maybe some of you have actually felt that way lately. Like, where is God at? Maybe even if you have Christian, if you have friends that are not Christians, friends that aren't followers of Jesus, friends that don't believe, maybe they'll be like, yeah, okay, God's good. Whatever, dude. Have you seen what's going on? This actually persists in the Psalm, so I'll invite you to flip over to verse, or sorry, chapter 42, <clears throat> verses 9 and 10. The psalmist again says, I say to God, my rock. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning 
because of the oppression of the enemy. So again, the psalmists are writing, people are coming against the psalmist. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? And so again, the psalmist has other people talking trash and kind of doubting the goodness of God. But then watch this. The psalmist takes a turn in the next Psalm 43 verse two, should be on the same page in your Bible. It says, watch them <laughs> affirm confidence to God, but then like uh, take a quick shift the other direction. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Oh, that sounds nice. Why have you rejected me? That's where it goes next. He's like, you are the God in which I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? That's where he goes. Why do I go about mourning? Because of the oppression of my enemies or my, the oppression of the enemy. And so we see the psalmist, like if this was like a pastor, like they're questioning God. They seem like they're upset with God. They're like, you're my refuge. Also, why have you forgotten me? Like, what if I had said that like from stage or a pulpit or whatever, or on here, you'd probably be like, geez, man, like don't air your dirty laundry in front of all of us. Like, we don't need to see all that. But the psalmist, like I said, is raw and real. It captures human experience. And so here's the first thing I want to give you today. From this psalm, 42 and 43, it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to be honest before the Lord. It's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to be honest. And again, I want to give you permission today. That's my word, permission. It's okay to not feel okay. It's okay to feel how you're feeling, anxious, depressed. However, it's okay. You're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not sinful. No, you can feel a certain way. And as followers of Jesus, as those who have a biblical worldview, we assess how we're feeling and then we can make decisions that will then lead to actions. And that's, those are two important steps. But just feeling a certain way, that is not objectively evil. Once we take account of how we're feeling, then we start to make decisions that are stemmed and fueled from our beliefs and our faith, and then we act from that place. And those are the things that are important. But feeling a certain way, oh my gosh, you're totally okay with that. Doubting? The psalmist kind of doubts throughout the psalm, and I don't even have time to go into every verse. The psalmist doubts. Doubting is normal. I've talked to students. Now, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I don't want to give you license to doubt. Oh, doubt everything about your faith. No. But what I'm saying is, every single follower of Jesus, every single person living with this biblical worldview will come to a place where they start to ask hard questions, where they start to uh, doubt some stuff. Every character, not every character, most characters in the Bible come to a place of questioning and doubt. Like pick one. They all do. Even the disciples of Jesus doubt and ask questions. And even they actually turn away from Jesus a couple times. And so this is a normal part of life. I've talked to followers of Jesus, especially young people that go, you know, I'm having some doubts. I'm probably not a Christian. I'm like, no, that's actually a very Christian thing to do because here's what's on the other side of doubt. You ex were actually through the process, you learn, you grow, you get discernment, you get into the word, you dive in, you chomp it up. And usually there's wisdom on the other side of that. Which is why I will recommend that if you're going through a season of doubt, you seek counsel, you seek help. We're here to answer your questions. Your group leader is there to answer your questions. Your parents are there to answer questions. Pray and ask the Lord to give you some insight. So it's okay. I'm gonna just tell you that right now. And, and, and here's something else I need you to know. You can express emotions while still maintaining your devotion, okay? I don't like to rhyme things a lot, but I feel like that helped me remember it. You can express emotions, but maintain your devotion. I don't have to tell you this. If you're a, an Atlanta sports fan, you emo have strong emotions. You love the Braves. You love the Falcons. You love the Hawks. But you also get upset because they don't win a lot. And so you can be like, oh my gosh, the Braves can't finish a game. Oh, the Hawks don't know how to draft or whatever. Whatever the, the beef is you have. I'm not an Atlanta sports fan. No offense. I'm just not from here. But you can get emotional about it, but that doesn't change your devotion. You're still fiercely devoted. I mean, people get upset about the Georgia Bulldogs all the time and talk to me about it. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not really a fan. But the, their devotion, their allegiance to the team doesn't, doesn't waver, but they're just expressing their emotions about it. And it's healthy and cathartic and it gets it out. So you have permission to do that. I can be emotionally vulnerable with my wife and still be really devoted to her. 
In fact, it helps our marriage, I feel like. And so I want to encourage you with that. Be vulnerable. Be honest. And you can be afraid too. Because here's what I know. There's trust on the other side of that. There's trust on the other, other side of that process. And in fact, in the Psalms, the movement of Psalms is orientation. Things are good. Disorientation. Everything's messed up. Everything's wrong. That's where we're at right now. To reorientation. It's the movement of the Psalms. Orientation. Things are good. Disorientation. It's all falling apart. Reorientation. Wow, I really got through that. And the Lord was kind and faithful and taught me a lot. And in the reorientation, you're always more mature, more sound, more steadfast in your faith. Because you're like, man, I've already been here before. And so keep that movement of the Psalms in mind. Now, next section I want to look at. We're going to skip down. Well, actually, I'll kind of just graze over this for the sake of time. But this part's really interesting. So as the psalmist is in this really bad place, you know where the psalmist goes? Check this. Psalmist goes at verse four. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go down with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. Now, throng, that's a weird word. Who uses that word? It actually means crowd. And the word picture here is actually a thick crowd of people. And what the psalmist is recalling are times when the psalmist would go with a group of people to go worship in the temple, to go worship in the house of God. So in this time of not feeling okay, not feeling good, they actually look back and they recall, man, remember when we all used to worship together? Remember when we used to go up to the temple and we'd make joyful, we'd have these joyful shouts and we would praise and give thanksgiving to God and we'd celebrate these holidays together. They actually look back at times they were able to worship together and they would long for those again. And man, if that doesn't hit home in this time, what does? Because you guys are probably feeling the same way. Like, man, remember when we used to be able to meet together? Maybe in this time of spiritual dryness or just at this time of anxiety and depression, you're like, man, I just wish we could be together again. Man, remember retreat? It was dope. Remember Easter? That was amazing. And the psalmist looks back and actually finds comfort in that. And sometimes in the most desperate times of life, the deepest valleys, the darkest times, it's nice to look back and remember what the Lord has done. Talking about retreat this last year, the Lord moved in power. In fact, the banner on our YouTube page has a picture from retreat that always reminds me of how the Lord moved and where our devotion and where our intention and passion in student ministries is directed whoop, to the Lord. And so I always look back at that and it triggers a memory and it triggers an emotion and it triggers the, this, this feeling of trust and remembrance that the Lord is good and the Lord is kind. And man, it like takes me back there. And, and art and songs have a way of doing that. Sometimes you hear a song or you, you, you see a movie and it, man, it, it's nostalgia. It takes you back to a time. And so that's what happens with the psalmist. And I want to encourage you with that. If you feel disconnected from the church, if you feel disconnected in your faith because you've been disconnected from the church, look back and remember the goodness and look forward in anticipation because that's what the psalmist does. And in fact, at the end of Psalm 43, the psalmist talks about how pretty soon I'm going to go back to the temple and worship again. And so look back, look forward, and remember in this time. And look forward to the day where we can meet together again to have that encouragement, that corporate worship, that corporate praise. Last section I want to cover here. And this is a reoccurring thing. So like in a, in a certain songs, you have a chorus that appears again and again. You sing the chorus, you sing the chorus, you sing the chorus, and it happens again and again and again. In, in some songs, you call this a refrain. There's a refrain in this song, and it goes like this. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. That's in verse five. Then look what he says in verse 11. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Flip over to verse 43, the very end of this whole 42 and 43, this whole psalm. It's book ended with verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He says it again and again and again. It's in verse 5, verse 11, and then verse 5 of chapter 43. This is strategic. And this is unique, too, amongst the Psalms because there's like this internal dialogue. Like the psalmist is like talking to themselves. It's weird. It's almost like they kind of like, 
have like an alter ego and they're like, hey, why are you so downcast? It's almost like you're speaking to their soul. Why are you so downcast on my soul? It's really interesting. Now, the words, <clears throat> we don't use the word downcast anymore. Like who uses that word? The word downcast in Hebrew, I won't say it because it sounds super ugly, but the word in Hebrew actually means to be downcast, to be despairing, actually has this word picture too of being face down mourning. There's actually this uh, gift that's really popular where it's like this, this kid is from the show Arrested Development. He like comes home and he just like collapses on the floor and he lays face down. We've all had that day. We all have felt that way. That's what this word is getting at. Downcast, despairing, bowed down in mourning. And then there's this word used. It says, <clears throat> why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? The word for this, it's actually chama in Hebrew, turmoil, actually has to do with sound. I feel like turmoil doesn't really like cover it necessarily in English. It has to do with sound. And so it actually means, um, it, it says, my soul, why are you so disturbing or disruptive within me? Why are you so loud within me, O oh my soul? Why, why are you, the, the word also can be interpreted pounding. Why are you pounding? If you've ever, ever had anxiety, you know you get that like pounding in your chest. You can almost like, feel it in your head. Another way it could be translated is roaring. It's used to describe the roar of waves. Why are you roaring within me to where it's almost drowning everything else out? This word can also be used um, for animals when they're growling, like a lion or a tiger or a dog, when they're growling. So why are you growling within me? And so the psalmist is saying, hey, it's, it's talking to, the psalmist is not talking to the Lord at this part, not talking to other people, not talking to the enemy. They're talking to themselves. It's very interesting. And they're saying, why are you so downcast? Why are you so like face down mourning? And then why, my soul, why are you so loud? And if you've ever had those thoughts that just ring in your ear, those thoughts that just like again and again are oppressing you, if you have that heart that's just pounding with anxiety and you can't get it to stop, you know what I'm talking about. It's that feeling. And so the psalmist is experiencing that. They're feeling that and they're like, stop. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you so disruptive? I can't even concentrate on what I'm trying to do. I can't even focus on the blessings the Lord has placed in my life. I can't even focus on following Jesus because you're so loud and disruptive and I keep having these thoughts again and again and I can't shut them down. Or this anxiety in my body, I can't get it to, to like, I can't quell it or get it to stop. Maybe you've been there and that's okay. And here's a beautifully therapeutic thing that we see in this Psalm. And this is something I want you to take away. The Psalmist externalizes the internalized. I'm gonna unpack that. They externalize the internalized. They take what they're feeling. It's almost like they just like er, open up, reach down and get their soul. And it's like they sit there and talk to their soul. They're the deepest part of them, their deepest feelings, their deepest longings, their deepest fears. And it's like they speak, the psalmist is speaking to those deepest fears and longings. And this is a good thing to do because I think sometimes we put too much trust in how we're feeling. Again, it's okay to feel how you're feeling, but don't put your trust in that because it says in scripture that the heart is deceitful among all things. Our minds can get confused. I've talked to people in deep seasons of depression, people even in seasons where like even like deeper, darker depression, and they're like, bro, I, I couldn't think straight. And so sometimes we don't even want to trust our thoughts. I think sometimes we almost have to talk to our soul, talk to our thoughts, talk to our mind, talk to our hearts, and be like, listen, I'm going to speak some truth real quick because I need to speak some truth. I use this illustration a lot, and I've gone to talk to a counselor before, and that's super helpful. But the way I view my emotions and my anxiety, sometimes it's like Christmas lights that are in the attic, and they're all knotted up and wadded into a ball. I feel like that's how it gets in my chest, right? Or that's how it gets in my mind. They're all like wadded up. And I feel like you have to like take them out of the attic, untangle them, lay them out, and then you can see how many Christmas lights you have. Or you can be like, oh, I don't need more Christmas lights. Or like, oh, none of these work. And I feel like you have to do that with your emotions. You have to do that with your anxiety. You have to do that with your depression. You gotta get it out. You gotta externalize the internalize and you gotta look at it and assess it. And so sometimes, let me give you just a couple like practical things here. Sometimes that looks like paper. Sometimes when I write something down, I get so clustered in my head and in my heart and in my emotions and in my soul that if I put something on paper, I'm like, oh, ha ha. Now it's not this like cloud over me or this wadded up ball of Christmas lights. It's this thing I can like sit and look at. That is how I'm feeling. Okay, I've got clarity now on that. I can, I can speak to it. I can pray about it. I can seek counsel. But sometimes it's good to externalize it to another person. And so maybe for you that looks like taking this anxiety, taking this depression, and talking to a good, trusted friend with wise counsel. But I would say what's better is to talk to a parent about it. I would say what's more, you could talk to your group leader about it. 
you can talk to us about it. You can talk to, I, I would even say, it might be beneficial to talk to a counselor about it. Maybe just tell your parents like, hey, I feel like I need to go talk to someone about how I'm feeling. And that's okay, that's good. I feel like that's healthy. It's externalizing the internalized. Ultimately, our hope is in the Lord. Ultimately, our purpose is in following Jesus. Ultimately, our comfort is through the Holy Spirit. But man, the Lord has given us the blessing of being able to like put pen to paper and write stuff down. He's given us the blessing of being able to talk to people and externalize it and go, whew, I'm not alone in it anymore, and now I can bounce my ideas off someone. It seems more tangible now. It's not this thing that's like over my head or like knotted up. So externalize the internalized. And I think this practice, kind of the, one of the last sections here I want to get to, this practice of talking to your emotions, talking to your pain, talking to the deepest depths of despair is profitable. There's this, uh, this old school throwback preacher named Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he's talking about depression, and he says when it comes to depression, we should do more talking than listening to the depression. I thought that was good. Now there are clinical depressions, and again, seeking help is beautiful, beneficial, and a blessing from the Lord. But Martin Lloyd-Jones struggled with depression, and he said he spoke to his depression, and he spoke truth to his depression. I would say, I've struggled with anxiety. Speak truth to your anxiety. Um, I went and talked to a counselor one time, and they're like, Matt, your brain does this weird thing, which I'm like, let me stop you right there. Not surprised. But he's like, your brain does this weird thing where like, the littlest thing will happen and your body literally thinks you're getting ready to die and your body will go into a panic mode, like a panic attack. It doesn't make any sense. So what you have to do in those moments, Matt, is say, hey, you're not gonna die. Your life is not in jeopardy. It's not at risk. You're okay. You have to talk to your anxiety. And so that's helped me, because I'll notice that. Like the littlest thing happens, I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's like my body is telling, my brain is telling my body, you're gonna die. But that's not the case. Maybe it's just like, I don't know, some kind of like personal problem with something or someone or something went wrong in my day. So do more talking to your anxiety than listening. If all you do is let those, again, the pounding, the roaring, the growling, that word come off, if that's all you listen to, man, that's gonna obscure your focus and, and it's gonna distract you from following Jesus and living in fullness of joy. You gotta talk to it, speak truth to it. Don't be passive about it. If you're struggling with anxiety, don't just let it happen to you. Speak to it. If you're struggling with depression, don't let it just happen to you. Speak to it. And again, seek help needed, externalize the internalize. And that is a gift from the Lord who we ultimately place our trust in from beginning to end. The psalmist ends that whole section, the why so downcast section. I love this. He's talking to his soul. He says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. It's really interesting is the word hope here is this word yakal in Hebrew. And it's the same word for waiting. Hope in this context, yakal, it's actually just this waiting and expectation. And so part of the spiritual life is waiting. And man, you guys have had to do some waiting. You guys, I'm gonna just keep it 100. You guys have had a way harder high school experience than I, than I had. The things I struggled with was like, I told this girl I liked her and she told me she's not into ugly dudes. And I'm like, ah. but you guys are dealing with a global pandemic and you're having to wait it out. But in the waiting, you can hope. It's like one goes with the other. It's just part of the process of your spiritual life. Wait in hopeful expectation for the Lord to move. Looking back at what the Lord has done, looking forward to what the Lord will do, and trusting that the Lord's in control of the whole thing. And in fact, it says in this psalm, in that very section, that the Lord will deliver. He actually says, my salvation, my God. Well, the, sal the word salvation in Hebrew is actually Yeshua, which was actually Jesus' name in his culture. His name was Yeshua. God delivers, God's salvation. And so we know our ultimate salvation, ultimately, no matter what happens, is in Jesus. We've been delivered from a life of hopelessness. We've been delivered from guilt. We've been delivered from punishment of sin. We've been delivered from just having to trust the things in the here and now and, and people and that. No, we actually, <laughs> we have deliverance from all that. Deliverance from our, our anxiety, from our depression, because Jesus has overcome all those things. The earliest church believed that Jesus was over and above everything, and that's where they took confidence. And so we hope in expectation for the Lord to move, for the Lord to work. But we know ultimately we already had the victory. Like check the score. 
we've already been delivered. And so we just have to wait in the meantime, in between time. And as we do that, we can be honest about how we feel and we can talk to one another about it. So as we leave here today, my encouragement to you is to be vulnerable and to be honest. That's healthier. My encouragement to you is in those seasons of vulnerability and honesty and not feeling good to look back and remember what the Lord has done and look forward and remember and be excited about what the Lord will do. My encouragement to you today is to externalize and internalize. Get it out. Speak to your soul. Don't be passive with your anxiety or your, or your depression. Speak to it. Speak truth to it. And then wait in a hopeful expectation for the Lord to move. Grace and peace to you.